Gift Biz Unwrapped, episode 356. Sometimes it takes a long time just to come back to recognizing who you were all along. Attention gifters, bakers, crafters, and makers. Pursuing your dream can be fun. Whether you have an established business or are looking to start one now, you are in the right place. This is Gift Biz Unwrapped, helping you turn your skill into a flourishing business. Join us for an episode packed full of invaluable guidance, resources, and the support you need to grow your gift biz. Here is your host, gift biz gal, Sue Monheit. Hello, hello. Welcome to the podcast today. If you haven't yet seen the classes that we did in honor of National Bakers Crafters Bakers Day, they're still available for viewing. Six 20-minute classes covering things that enrich your life overall. Non-business topics like pie crust making, yoga, meditation and breath work, gift design, salsa dancing, and artistic journaling. You may ask why on a business development podcast I coordinated these classes. Where's the fit? Well, I believe that feeling great on the inside radiates outward to everything you do, including your business. So for a celebration of handmade creators, it fits right in. You can see all the classes on demand for free and no opt-in required. You'll find them over at handmadehealstheworld.com. Now, with regard to today's show, I'm looking forward to sharing this interview with you because it's a really good example of how you can extend your love for a handmade product above and beyond the making and selling. What I'm talking about is applying the skills and knowledge you've developed with a handmade product and using it for a career in the same industry, but from a different angle. Do you ever wonder how people get into the careers that they have today? In this case, how did Anne Marie go from thinking she'd be a professional ballet dancer and end up as a writer, editor, and recipe developer in the baking industry. It definitely wasn't a straight line, but nor are most journeys. In her story, I think you'll be inspired and maybe even see parallels to the twists and turns you're taking and be motivated by the potential of where your path will lead you. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Anne-Marie Madela. Anne-Marie is the managing editor at American Cake Decorating Magazine. She's also a pastry chef and food content creator focused on the sweet side of life, baking. After graduating from the Institute of Culinary Education, she spent more than a decade as a freelance baker and cake decorator before returning to school to focus on media. She earned her master's degree in food studies from New York University and began her writing career with Pastry Arts Magazine. She is a co-founder, an editor, and a recipe developer for Pastry at Home, as well as a freelance writer for other food media outlets. Anne-Marie, welcome to the Gift Biz Unwrapped podcast. Thank you for having me, Sue. I am so excited that you're here, and I have to tell all our listeners how we met really quickly. We were at the Ultimate Sugar Show, and you came up to my booth, and we were chatting back and forth a little bit. You were sharing some of your experiences, and then I said, okay, stop. Don't tell me anymore. Will you come and be a guest on the podcast? To which you said yes. (laughs) Yes. I'm so glad that we had that moment going booth to booth with a mask on and trying to introduce yourself to people. I felt you know it was just perfect timing and kismet, so I'm glad that you have me on. Yes, I'm excited to share your story with everybody. And like I said, I stopped you, so I don't know the whole story either. That's the way I like to roll. So when I'm learning things about you, it's very genuine. It's not like we're repeating something that we've already talked about, right? Yes. (laughs) But I am going to delay that conversation for a short second because I'd like you to share with us how you would describe yourself through a motivational candle. So if you were to create a candle that really just speaks to you by color and a saying or a quote, what would your candle look like? Okay. My candle would definitely be lavender. 
I'm a huge fan of purple. Purple is my birthstone. It's just always been my favorite color. So I would go lavender because it's calming, which I need because I am not. And then (laughs) I would say it took me a bit to figure out what I would write on my candle, but I'm just going to go with the quote that I actually wrote in my high school yearbook many years ago. And it is kind of snotty, but it is one of my favorite quotes of all time. It is from Andy Warhol. And it is, it takes a lot of work to figure out how to look so good. And the reason I chose that is because at first it comes off of, oh, it's me. I want to look the best I can look. But that's actually not the case. I feel like when you're in a creative industry, especially doing the things that I do, it actually does take a lot of hard work to figure out and to produce something to look so good. A lot of people don't see the behind the scenes actions that it takes a creative person to do. And so I feel like this quote has more than one meaning and you can really look into it, which is so Warhol. So for sure. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and as I'm thinking of the quote, when, as you've said it, it said two things to me too, one more cautionary and one more motivational. The cautionary one is as makers, we can spend so much time perfecting what we make and production time is dollars. Absolutely. So at some point, you just have to say, this is beautiful as it is moving on. Yep. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) So yes, you can spend a lot of time making it look good. And there comes a point when it looks really good, but you're a critical eye and you just need to stop. Oh, absolutely. That is a lesson, a hard learned lesson. And it is a constant struggle. (laughs) Yeah, you just have to stop. But you can stop and move on to other creative things then too. It doesn't mean you have to stop your creativity. Exactly. So that was the first thing. The other thing that I was thinking of that just the both of these things came to mind just as you were saying this is it does take a long time to figure out how to look so good in terms of your style. If you're creating something, it's the style of how you make your cakes or design your jewelry, what you're bringing that's different from anybody else. And that is an evolutionary process, and it does take some time. Absolutely, it does. And sometimes it takes a long time just to come back to recognizing who you were all along. There are some things I think about the way I am and about my type of creativity that has always been there. But sometimes you just have to take this journey, long journey, which I have had just to come back to, oh, this is me. I will always choose purple. I will always choose a Warhol quote. I will always choose this. But sometimes it does take a lot of time to just hone in on who you are. That is really, really smart advice. (laughs) Very wise. I think everyone needs to just sit and think about that for a minute because you're so right. When I got married, peach was like the color. Everything you saw everywhere was peach. And I'm like, well, that's not really my color, but it is pretty. And so if you want to believe this, I got all of my wedding china, everything in my registry and everything. I picked a design that was peach. I'm not a peach girl. (laughs) (laughs) By a long shot. I mean, I like the color, but I'm not. So that was the craziest thing. So now I have all this peach china that I never use because it's not my color. (laughs) And I was lucky. I got my china just when they had released a lavender edged piece, which we'll get to in a second. It's called ballet ribbons. So that spoke to me. And then they came out with this lavender edged piece of China. And I was like, that's me. This is me in China. Would you know, I did not take it out of its box for 10 years. Oh, no. After my divorce, I'm divorced. And I never took it out of its box until like 10 years later. It finally revealed. And I was like, God, I picked the right thing. This is so me. And it's now discontinued. And I don't care. It is me. And I will track down every piece of discontinued piece of ballet ribbons because it is so me. And I'm so glad I made that decision, at least of my China. (laughs) But it just goes back to what you were talking about. So, so smart recognizing who you were all along, like who you are. Absolutely. And it does sometimes take a struggle to diverge from that and just come back to that. And I constantly still do that in my life. And I don't think I will ever stop doing that. You know what I think another angle of this is too, is we are with ourselves all the time, Mm -hmm. obviously. And so who we are feels like it's not new news. Right. So when you're doing something where you're putting yourself out there, you're getting visibility, you feel like you have to be something greater than who you are, when really the best thing to do is just be who you are already. That's where you're most comfortable anyway. Absolutely. A thousand percent. And 
I think the big risk is just putting yourself out there. The risk isn't being who you are. The risk is putting yourself out there and making sure that people accept who you are. That's, I think, one of the hardest pieces of it. Yeah, being confident enough in who you are to put yourself out in a genuine way. Absolutely. Yeah. We don't have to be someone that we think our audience wants to see. We need to be who we are. Absolutely. (laughs) All right. So let's take a step back. I want to hear about your journey. It's been now, what, five or six months since the show, and I've been waiting in suspense this whole time (laughs) to hear your story. I definitely have an interesting story. I think everybody does, but when I tell mine, people are like, wow, okay. (laughs) Yeah. All right. So you get to choose where we start with the story. Well, I will, I guess, start at the beginning when I was younger, just because it's come up a few times or at least once. In the fact that when I was younger, my dream was to be a ballet dancer. I am a bun head. (laughs) I still have a bun in my head. I think actually my first logo of when I got into caking was a silhouette of me with a bun on my head holding a cake because that was just who I was when I was younger. I was really into it. I loved everything artistic, but I think my passion lent itself towards dance. I was put in it because I was a very active child and my mother did not know what to do with me. And so she put me in dance and I just fell in love with it. And so when I was in high school, I was trying to figure out what I really wanted to do. I loved it so much that I was like, I'm going to be a theater major. And I think my freshman year, I was like, no, no, no. There's just no way I could be a professional dancer. My body's just not built to be that way. I had the passion for it. I didn't have that level of talent that I could be a professional at it. So I thank the world of ballet for my passion for the arts. I thank ballet for my extremely good posture (laughs) (laughs) and ability to wear my hair up. But that is not really where I think I was going to end up in my life. And kind of at the same time in high school, I think just as many very feminine females are, I'm kind of that way. I fell in love with fashion. Somewhere in high school, one of my friends bought me a subscription to Vogue very early on. I think we were like 14 or 15. And I was like, wow, what is this? I love fashion. And if you look at it, actually, the aesthetics of a lot of fashion is very closely connected to the arts and ballet. And so it's a natural progression, I think. And just ruining your feet with some sort of shoes. (laughs) <laughs> so I fell in love with fashion, hence the Andy Warhol quote in my uh, high school senior yearbook. And so I transferred to the Fashion Institute of Technology my sophomore year of college and was all, all in with fashion. Started my career there and spent 18 years climbing up the corporate ladder in fashion. I was not a design major. I was a business major. And so it's that balance of like that left and right brain where you can be in a creative industry, but have a business focus. I think that worked really well for my brain. So what type of positions did you have in fashion? It was mostly product development, sourcing, production. And so I was the back end. So the people that you don't actually see most of the time in fashion, I'm the one who spoke to the factories, got the products made, negotiated prices, made sure everything was approved and on time and in the stores, and then kind of handled any quality call out issues and things like that. So that's essentially without going into the very dirty, gross details of the fashion industry, what my career was built on. Mm -hmm. But you combine then your business degree with your love of fashion together. Absolutely. And let's be honest, the discounts that you get while you're in the fashion industry are phenomenal. (laughs) Well, and you stay on top of all the trends. You know everything before anybody else, too. Absolutely. You know everything about nine months to a year before everybody else, right? (laughs) Oh, that's cool. (laughs) Right. And then you also know when everything's about to go on sale. So that's really helpful, especially because I live in New York and it is very expensive here. So is there such a thing versus insider trading, insider shopping? Because you know. (laughs) A little bit, sure. Or you can actually, once you kind of know the industry, you can kind of guess too. Like, oh, well, this is going to be on a 12-week cycle. So at about week eight, this is going to go on sale. And by week 10, it's going to be probably at its lowest price if you can still get your size. So like you just kind of guess and know because pretty much the industry is run the same way no matter what product or company it is. Perks of the biz, for sure. Absolutely. 
What else did you like about that time? You spent a lot of years there. I did. I will say it is a tough, very hard industry. One of the biggest benefits about the industry is the camaraderie of your coworkers. I do miss that a lot because most of my job right now is remote. I loved being in an office setting with like-minded people who just kept me so motivated just to get through all the like poop emoji stuff that you just have to get through to climb that corporate ladder. Some of my very best friends were my work wives. And honestly, some of the best people you meet are from work. And so although it is not necessarily pushing you in a creative manner, it is certainly helping you get through the drudgy details. And it just makes your work life that much better when you meet wonderful people. Yeah. And you can all relate to the same thing versus trying to tell the story to someone who isn't living it. Oh, absolutely. Right. Still to this day, I still have connections to the fashion industry. And man, when they tell me stories, I can understand it. And it just reminds me I don't miss it. But it is so nice that they can come to me and complain because I know what they're talking about, you know, and wow, I just do not miss it. <laughs> yeah, nothing like affirmation for the path you're on now. <laughs> a thousand percent. <laughs> absolutely. But you invested a lot of time in that field. So then to make a switch... I'm curious to hear about that. Yeah. So very early on, as much as I love fashion, and I still do, I still do, man, my shoe collection is out of control. But very early on, I could just tell I wasn't passionate about it in a job sense. I'm passionate about it because I just love clothing and accessories, but I just knew it wasn't quite right for me. And so probably... Even just a few years into being in the industry, I still felt that like creative urge and I needed a creative outlet to do something. And so I started taking classes at the Institute of Culinary Education. It is, if you've never been, or if you haven't heard of it, it is an incredible culinary school, not only for going full time as a student, but they have these incredible classes that you can take just for recreation. And I started taking those and I really just fell in love with taking baking classes. And so the more I thought about it, the more I was like, hey, you know, maybe I want to go to pastry school. And it took a few years of me taking different classes and saying, you know, I really like this. I wonder if I should go back to school. And would you know it? I'm telling you, it's just a sign from whatever heavens you might believe in. I entered a contest on the Food Network. I kid you not. And it was just one of those, like you're watching TV and they're like, enter in your phone number and your email and you could win a partial scholarship to culinary school. And I won. <laughs> <laughs> and it was for the culinary school that I was already going to is ICE. And so they have programs that are part-time and you can go after work and you can go on weekends. And so I did not have to give up my career to start pursuing something else. And so I thought it was a sign. And I said, all right, I'm going to culinary school. And that was about 2008, I want to say. I started 2008, graduated in 2009. It's a wonderful program because you can go full-time for six months or go part-time for nine months. And then you do an internship. So it's a few months. So it's about a year of your life. And when I tell you, it was one of the most amazing years of my life, not from work, but for just for going to school. One of the most incredible years of my life where I was like, I love every second of this. I love wow. it. I just fell in love with it. And I was like, I want to be in baking. But the problem with being a little bit older and having a stable career and just the way life lends itself, there was no way I could give up my corporate career and have the life I wanted to lead and be a baker for $7 an hour. There just wasn't a way to do that. And so I did what many other people did. I had a side gig for well over a decade and I baked cakes for people. And luckily the fashion industry is so predominantly female when I say it's like 65, 70% female globally that works in the fashion industry, it's insane that everybody was getting married and having babies and guess who made all of their cakes. And still to this day, I'd say I'm semi-retired from baking for people, 
But still to this day, 12 plus years, 13 years later, I'm still baking for people that I made their bridal showers and now their kids are like teenagers and I'm making their cakes still. So it's a really good connection to have to know so many people who want cake. So did you start a business, baking, design, wedding cake business on the side? I did. Okay. All right. And the people that you knew from your job were your ready-made testing ground and first clients. Oh, yes. The wonderful thing is most of them, obviously, because I was in school while while I was still working, what I would do is every Monday and Tuesday, because I would go to school... Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. So every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I would bring whatever I had created the night before in school. I'd bring it. I'd send out like an email blast of like what it was, do a funny little definition about it, and then like leave it out for people to sample in our little like cafe area. And so everybody kind of got to know that, oh, Anne Marie's in school. Anne Marie's a baker. And then when I started doing my own thing just for fun I would just bring in things even post school and so people just got to know and so they're like hey and it started just at work right like oh we're throwing a work baby shower for somebody or a bridal shower for somebody and then it just grew and grew and grew where by the following year yeah I made my boss's wedding cake <laughs> a four-tiered wedding cake oh my gosh so were you strategically doing it or were you providing it just because you enjoy cooking and it was fun and you and like sharing yeah oh my gosh yeah absolutely and did i think ooh i could probably turn this into a business absolutely And there were moments along the way where I started working with caterers and I started working with friends of friends of friends. And then social media came along and people on Facebook would find me. People eventually on Instagram would find me. And there were moments where, yes, I could easily have, I'm going to go for this. And it just never felt quite right for me. I was, there was something holding me back. You had a good job. Yes, absolutely. With benefits and security. (laughs) That paycheck to be able to pay the exorbitant rents (laughs) of New York. This was before you could get health insurance anywhere else. I needed that stability in my life. I needed to pay my school loans off. I needed to start my 401k. I needed to build that piece of my life. And I didn't have the stability behind me to let that go. And there was something, I actually pretty risk adverse. And so there was something really holding me back. And I didn't know what it was to be perfectly honest with you, but there was something in my body that was just like, you are not meant to be this. You are not meant to necessarily own a cake business. And I watch people do it now, especially, you know, now that I work for a cake magazine and I watch people progress and do it. And I'm so proud of them. And I like, I'm in their corner and I want to promote them as much as I can because like, wow, good for you. It is incredibly difficult to do. And I just knew it wasn't necessarily for me. I just couldn't figure out what it was that I really wanted to do until many years later. But yeah, I mean, I had the opportunity to do it. Sure. Well, and I think there are people listening now who probably feel they're doing something on the side, baking or whatever their handmade product business is, but they do have a nine to five job with all the benefits that that brings, the financial stability and all of that, but they kind of feel like they want to go into their full craft, but they know they shouldn't. And I want to say to people, that's okay. That is absolutely okay. Just like you were saying, you weren't meant for that. Like there's nothing says that you have to be full time in your handmade business. Absolutely not. And you might gravitate to it at some point. You might never do that. But you're not less than if you're doing it on the side versus someone who's doing it full time. These are choices that we have to make for ourselves that fit our lifestyles. Absolutely. And I find that sometimes, okay, I'm lucky here in New York that I always say this, almost every single person I know has a side hustle in New York. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just like to have extra cash or maybe it is a lot of us need that creative outlet because we have very stressful lives. Whatever it is that motivates us to do it, there is absolutely nothing wrong with keeping your side hustle a side hustle. There's nothing wrong with that. I know plenty of people who, you know, even one of my friends' moms, one of my high school friends' moms, so if we're our age, our moms are in their late 60s, who 
was a nurse, a career nurse, and just retired, but has been making cakes on the side for the entire time and never decided to do anything else with her side hustle ever until she retired and was like, oh, okay, I can make more cakes now because I'm retired. But there's nothing wrong with that. And it is a difficult decision to jump into it. And again, I give full credit and support anybody who wants to make their side hustle a full-time career. It's wonderful, but that's not meant for everybody. Yeah. I'm also seeing a big trend with that now because when people are retiring, they want to retire to something. Sure. They're not retiring to the rocking chair on their front porch. Right. And same thing. I know someone who was also in the medical industry and she retired and started a whole floral shop. Yeah. It's like your career that you're starting to grow and develop after your other career, your earlier career. Because now in our life, we can have two at the same time or merge one into another. So many opportunities for us. There really are. I remember reading many years ago that each generation has more and more careers. They said something like the millennials will have more than six different careers in their lives. Six different careers. Like that blows my mind. I remember when I was in fashion and trying to contemplate a second career was hard enough for me. Just to think that people and future generations will have six to 10 different career paths. That's incredible to me and good for them. Good. They should be able to switch and not be stuck in. It's a life of diversity, really. Yeah, I'm astounded by that and really like humbled that people can risk things and just go for it. That's great. Yeah, I love it so much. So we are now at the point where you were baking your boss's wedding cake. Yeah. <laughs> so you're still in fashion, yes. but you're baking. And I want to just point out a couple of things here before we keep going, because I want everyone to track along with us here. Some of the things I like so much, Anne-Marie, about your story is there are a lot of people here who know they want to start something. They're very creative. They have their hands in a million different creative ideas. But what you did is just on a very fun, spirited approach, we're taking classes just for that as a hobby to do something else. And that led you into where your passions were. Yes. Because a lot of people don't know what they would want to do. They know they want to do something, but they don't know. So this is a perfect example of what you did of investigating and discovering what feels best and what feels right. Absolutely. And then you found something and then you started getting professional skills through your training in that area. So now you're now just not a hobbyist. You've also now got your degree with the Institute of Culinary Education, et cetera, and then started building your business slowly as a side business. Yes. So I think that graduated level, because a lot of people don't see that. They see someone wants to start a business and now all of a sudden they have it and not all the in-between. And it's a foggy of how you get there. Yes. It is a mishmash, a jumble, a journey to get to a different place. You don't just wake up one day. I mean, some people do. I am not one of those people and most people aren't like that. You don't just wake up one day and be like, I'm going to open a bakery. You need a skill level, research, and just time invested to figure it out. And I'm glad I didn't go into things blindly. It was a slow progression to get there and to say, I love this and I will figure it out. And I still, even with baking, although I, I still like to take more advanced classes because I never want to stop learning. There are other things that I love to be a hobbyist. So taking the opportunity to try something, to see if you like it, and if you don't, drop it. It's fine. But like even I didn't learn how to sew until I was 30, which I know it sounds crazy because I was in the fashion industry and I didn't know how to sew. <laughs> a lot of people don't. So I took for my 30th birthday, I was like, I'm going to take sewing classes and I can make pillows and curtains and that's about it. I made a dress once. But trying something, taking a class in something will always better your skills in some sort of way, or at least motivate you or, I don't know, like push you to keep trying, keep learning. There's always something you can learn, whether it's learning that you don't like it or learning like, oh, I want to keep going or try something connected to it or whatever it is. There's always something new that you can learn out there. And there's so many more opportunities to do that. I mean, obviously, like YouTube didn't exist 
<laughs> when I wanted to go back to school and all these online classes and Instagram classes and all these like crazy things you can do now just off of the computer didn't exist. And now that they yeah. do, it's like, wow, what else can I learn? And again, I'm constantly learning and figuring out, is there something else I can develop and learn? There's a whole new host of skills now that I'm in food media that I had to learn. And it's great. I love it. And it's acceptable now. It used to not yes. be. Like if you worked at a corporation and heaven forbid your boss found out that you were doing something else. Oh, when my boss, this is a different boss, not the cool one I made the wedding cake for, but the larger like VP boss found out I was going to culinary school. I actually got pulled in to his office and he asked me like, are you in for the long term? Because I was on like a promotional track and he was actually going to halt promoting me because I was going back to school. And I had to ensure him that I was not going to quit just because I was in school that I wanted to stay so I could get promoted. Like it was so ridiculous that even 12 years ago, that was still the case. And I think it's getting easier and easier in this world now and in corporations that they kind of let you try something different and support that, which is wonderful to hear and see because it definitely wasn't the case even a decade ago. All right. Well, let's pick up on your story. Is one of your goals for this year a new approach to social? Are you finally admitting that you're spending far too much time there without seeing anything in the way of results? Or do you jump onto Instagram planning to post, but get caught up in all the fabulously produced reels? Then you get intimidated and step back. Yeah, <laughs> me too. We know at this point we should post consistently with quality content. But when it comes time to actually do it, figuring out what to post is overwhelming and time-consuming. That's why I created content for makers last year. Many of you have purchased this high-value, low-cost program and have newfound ease in your posting. And guess what? If you already have content for makers, there's no need to purchase it ever again. One and done, because it teaches you a posting strategy and prompts that are timeless and can be used over and over again. Now, based on your feedback, I've enhanced content for makers to include a hard copy social media scheduler. Because makers like tangible planners, where we can add our own creative punch to the mix, right? Drum roll. Introducing Connected 2022 a content scheduler that helps you plan out your topics, whether they're for social media, blog articles, or videos, all in one place. Now, to clarify, this is not your daily planner. This is focused on content planning. It includes direction on how to nail down a strategy, monthly cues for new content, and your own images. And it can be used in conjunction with content for makers, or as a standalone resource. Finally, feel in control of your content with a strategy and purpose, not just something random that you think of on the fly to publish that day. Intentional content saves time so you can focus on other business tasks and attracts customers, which brings eyes to your brand and orders to your cart. To see more about the Connected 2022 Social Media Scheduler, Go to giftbizunwrapped.com forward slash connected 2022. And now let's get back to the show. So you're providing samples for people who are in your office. They're loving it. You're starting to build a business. Now what? Uh, Intermission is over. Yeah. What happens next? <laughs> As I was saying, you know, I definitely have these opportunities to grow and branch out. And I felt like the more I dealt with caterers and larger orders, I hated it. It stressed me out to no end. And again, balancing a corporate career and this, it just became too much for me. And I started just to feel that I didn't like either thing I was doing. And I just kept reassessing, like, what do I really want to do? And this took years, mind you, 
I started baking in 2008. And it wasn't until probably 2018 ish. So that's a decade. I went, okay, I got to figure things out. I just cannot keep balancing these two things. It's stressing me out. I don't like taking cake orders anymore. And like, I felt my work was suffering from it. Not my corporate work, because my corporate work was, I mean, I could sleep and do that job just because I'd been doing it for so long. But I felt like my creative talents were suffering because the work piece of a side hustle was stressing me out too much. And so I was lucky at the time that I have a very, very supportive partner. My boyfriend, Andy, is incredible. He's my life partner. I just, wow, really lucky to have him in my corner. And he looked at me, he goes, it is time to make a decision. Like, what do you want to do? You're unhappy. Let's figure this out. And of course, my go-to answer always is, I think I want to go back to school. (laughs) Again, (laughs) not everybody's path in life. I just happen to be a school person. I always was like, a crazy school nerd. And I always felt like in me, I always wanted to get an advanced degree in something. That was just me. You know, all of my high school friends have their doctorates. And I was like, man, everybody has it. And it's not a competition thing, but I always felt like for me, that was something like I could and should achieve. Well, let me ask you a question at this point, real quick. So Andy was the one who said, okay, halt, time out, relook at this. Yes. And from what you're saying, interestingly, and this is something for all of us to think about wherever we are in our journey, the fact that you are getting more and more business is what most people would aspire to. You want those larger jobs and because the numbers are getting bigger. Mm -hmm. But as your numbers were getting bigger, the love and the satisfaction that you were getting from it was going down. Oh, yes. It was almost like one of those graphs where you can see the bigger the orders, my satisfaction level tanked. It was one was going one, one was going the other way. Again, I work in a very competitive city. (laughs) The quality of people ordering, the expectation levels, just dealing with customer service of people in New York is very difficult. (laughs) Right. So for some makers, this is the juncture where you need to add people onto your staff. It depends on what you're making. Like for you, Anne-Marie, your skill isn't totally as duplicatable. I mean, I guess you could get some people in the commercial kitchen to make some of the base parts of the cake, and then you're doing the decorating, etc. I'm not trying to go there, but I'm just pointing out that this could happen. But my real question to you is, what would have happened if Andy never said anything? Was he the point where you also looked at it, or would you have just kept going? Or what do you think would have happened if he didn't interject his opinion at that point? I think at some point I would have hit a wall on a breaking point anyway. I was lucky that he just at that moment put a mirror up to me and said, I want you to be happy. Let's figure this out together. Okay. So because I really think I was just in this like mindset of like, well, I'm just going to be miserable in my career. So I'm going to just be miserable in my side hustle too. Sometimes when you're stuck in it, you can't see the forest for the trees, right? You need somebody to like pull you out of it and put a mirror up to you and say, hey, 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 like, stop, let's figure this out. And originally, when I decided to go back to school, it was to get my degree to possibly then open a business. Like in my head, I said, okay, well, maybe I will actually start a business, but I think this degree would help me focus it a little bit. That was my original goal with going back for my master's was because part of that degree, you can go on the entrepreneurial track and write a business paper and set that up. So I was like, oh, okay, so maybe that is it because I really did want to do something with baking rather than fashion. I knew I needed to get out of the industry, but I wasn't sure what, and I was hoping the degree would finally push me in that direction, which it did not. But that's good. I'm glad it didn't because I found actually what I wanted to do. But yeah, I think sometimes you just need to look at the people in your life for help. And whether that be your significant other, your family, your friends, there's going to be somebody that knows you so well that looks at you and said, how can I help? And whether that is just talking through what your career moves will be or actually like physically helping you. Cause yes, he would carry cakes for me and drive me around and cut ribbons for me to tie bags. And I would always have help from people. 
I would have had a breaking moment, but he did it sooner for me. And I'm grateful for that. Yeah. Okay. So what happened? How did this transition occur? Yeah. So I had been for, again, typical me. It took me a few years. I had been eyeing up a few degrees and it was January 1st. (laughs) <laughs> a lot of things happen to me on New Year's Day sometimes, a lot of like aha moments. And it was a New Year's Day a few years ago. And I saw that NYU had a program and that you would have to apply by February. And I was like, well, it's January. I got plenty of time. And I did it. And I was like, well, if I get in, it was the only place I applied to, although there were a few other places around outside of New York. And I was like, I just can't leave New York. I'm such a New Yorker. And so I was like, well, this is the only program I'm applying to. So if I get in, great. If not, I'll figure it out. Like, this is my only school option at the time. And I got in. And then I was like, okay, this is what I'm doing. And for me, again, risk adverse. I went to school part-time at first, kept my corporate job. (laughs) Because of course. And then eventually, I just had this moment where he's like, you got to choose. And I had enough of emotional and financial backing that I just did it. And I leapt and I went to school full time. And it was, again, just like pastry school, an incredible experience where I was like, this is where I needed to be at this moment. Just those signs of like, yeah, this is what I want to do. It was incredible. I loved, again, every moment of being in grad school, even to the point where I graduated during the pandemic. So... (laughs) COVID-19 hit while I was doing my degree. So that was not fun. But the journey along the way, really what hit me was probably within the first few months of being in grad school, I saw a posting. They have job postings specifically for my major, and they were looking for a food writer with a background in pastry. And I went, oh my God. Did they just create that position for you? (laughs) Right. I was like, I'm applying to this. I have to get this job. And again, it was for Pastry Arts Magazine. So I still write for them. And I remember getting the email back and I was just shaking with excitement, shaking. I was like, I get to write about pastry. This is incredible. And I just knew it. It just hit me like a ton of bricks. I was like, I love this. I get to go to like events and write about like baguette competitions. Like this is so much fun. I love this. (laughs) And then I took, there are a few classes specifically for that. So one of the other tracks you can do in this master's is food media. And I was like, I think this is what I want to do. And I took food writing and there's a food media, like digital skills class, which is great, especially for if you're a little bit older and have to figure out exactly like the inner workings of Instagram. That was a great class. And I was like, this is it. This is it. Wow, wow, wow. I love this so very much. And you felt it right away. You knew it was a perfect fit right away. Oh, immediately. I just did. It was just very much like being in school where I was like, this is the moment. Like, this is what I want to do. As soon as I started writing and I got published, I was like, wow, 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 wow. Like, I just had that jitter, that excitement that is like, I love this so much. And this is what I can do. This is my creative outlet. And it is stressful in a different way, but it takes my love of pastry and takes away the stress of producing this product that who knows what the outcome will be and like puts the stress more on being creative in a way where you can like tinker with it a little bit more writing. You know, you can take a little bit more time and work with an editor to like shape it a little bit. And it just became my creative outlet where I was like, oh, this is what I want to do. Well, and you have the knowledge. So your writing is richer and deeper than someone who hadn't been in the industry or exposed. Yes, yes, yes. Absolutely. What is that saying? Write what you know. (laughs) Yeah. And so absolutely. And then the opportunities sort of started coming in after that. I started writing. I got some gigs writing. It's called commerce. I don't think a lot of people know what that means. Essentially, most websites and media platforms now earn their money through affiliates. And so If you write about a product and it is on Amazon, you get, and somebody clicks on that Amazon link when they're reading your article, your company, whoever you write for, gets a commission off of that. And so there is this incredible opportunity to write commerce-based food writing out there. 
And it just so happens oftentimes they look for somebody with a retail background to write about these products. Well, guess what? <laughs> I have a tremendous background in retail because I went to school for fashion. All I did was work for retail companies. And so that kind of got my in there. And so I started writing for a few different outlets, thekitchen.com being one of them. And now I'm starting to write for Forbes Vetted, where I'm like testing products and writing about sales and different things. And I love that because again, it's shopping. So hey, again, something I still love to this day. But it's an angle of like, yeah, I can talk about kitchen products because I have every single kitchen product you could ever wish for in my kitchen. So <laughs> let's talk about it and I'll tell you why it's good and come from a place of expertise, which I love doing. And so that actually lent itself to where I am today. Just under a year ago, I guess, niche magazines talk to niche magazines. And so the owner of Pastry Arts Magazine, Sean, he's an incredible human, was on the phone and just talking industry to Grace and Anya McNamara, who own American Cake Decorating Magazine. And they said, our editor just quit. Do you know somebody? And I swear to God, this has never, ever happened in my life where it's like, oh, do you know somebody to get this job? Like, I've always just never who you know. It's just luck of submitting your resume. This is the first time in my life where he's like, I have somebody. And he's like, wait, let me call her first. So he talked about me, I guess, for like an hour. And then was like, wait, maybe I should call her to see if she would like this job. <laughs> and called me. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> Yes. And wow. so put me in contact with them. And then I finally, you know, so I was writing and now this is editorial where I get to work with a bunch of contributors and develop this magazine from start to finish. And wow, it is an incredible use of like my creative juices and my organizational business brain that I had from fashion. It's those same skills that I had in my fashion life that I have now just developed and honed in differently to run this magazine. It's like everything that you've experienced all the way from back in ballet, like all of it has just come together. Yes, absolutely. It has culminated in, oh, yeah, I can do this. Oh, you want me to write a calendar of when things are due to make sure this product comes in on time? Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> oh, a calendar on Excel? Yes, I can do that. But then being able to work with creative people and just like mold it to something where it is this product at the end of the day but that people get to read is just, it's such a lovely feeling. And it's, again, very similar to the feelings of baking a cake or getting that sweater into the store, that end product where you can be so proud of. Yeah, it's an incredible feeling, but there's no way. I could do the job that I do now without every random step I made in my life. Every little step or misstep or path that I've taken has led me to this moment. Nothing in your life goes to waste. Use every moment and every skill and everything that you could ever learn in your life will be useful. Absolutely. And that's the big takeaway of your story for everybody who's listening is every step that you're in and you talk about the times when you were challenged and you weren't happy and you mm -hmm. weren't feeling fulfilled. I want everybody to think of that. If that's where you are right now, this is leading to something more. But you kept searching and taking action also. Absolutely. Like you just didn't sit there waiting for something to come. You reached out to find it too. Absolutely. And one of the great things about not liking your job or your career is you are constantly searching or that would motivate me to constantly be searching for what's next, right? Like mm -hmm. I am not happy. What can I do to give me any ounce of happiness? Whether that is, you know, I always tell my friends this, if you don't like your job, sometimes just updating your resume can give you that sense of satisfaction, knowing that if there is a job that you can apply to, well, look at that. My resume is already ready because I already updated. So sometimes just that little action of updating your resume. I remember even when I would move, the first thing I would do besides changing my address on for the postal service was I would like change my address on my resume, have it ready. You never know. Having that like two minute elevator pitch, those things that people tell you to do, do them because they actually do motivate you to keep going. I remember going to a cake show many, many years ago 
It was like one of the only cake shows done in New York. And it just wasn't a great cake show. It was like the first time they were running it. It was kind of crappy, to be perfectly honest with you. But one of the great things there, one of the teachers kind of realized that all of us were a little unhappy with the quality of the cake show. And she said this. She said, if you learn one thing, if you take away one little thing from whatever situation you're in, so one little thing from this crappy cake show, if you learn one thing, it is worth it. And I was like, that is so true. You can look at a situation, any situation, whether it's a cake show or whatever you're in and pick out one thing where you're like, I learned this. It's worth it. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. This has been amazing. Thank you so much for sharing the story. And I'm so glad I didn't hear it before (laughs) because, I mean, I was in suspense this absolute whole time. (laughs) Well, I'm glad. Maybe one day we'll delve into my personal life because then that is like a whole Hallmark movie. And that like adds to it. No, I'm joking. (laughs) No, you're not. (laughs) Oh, gosh. Well, as you project the future, Mm -hmm. what do you see for yourself as the next years come by? Yeah, I'm really hoping just to continue to develop this part of my career and see where this takes me. Because I'm always constantly surprised what life heads and what is in store. And so I don't want to say, oh, in five years from now, I want to be the editor in chief at New York Times cooking. Like, no. But do I want success? Yes. What does that look like? I'm not sure yet, but I want to keep investigating and I want to keep going and I want to take every opportunity I can to keep growing in this part of the industry. Because if you think about it, I'm fairly new, only a few years into food media man, I've got a lot to cover in a shorter period of time just because I'm a little bit older. You know, I'm not 22. I don't have the rest of my career to do this. Like I got to fast track this and I got to keep going. So I'm just going to push myself to see how far I can go. Ride the wave. See what comes. Absolutely. I'm ready for it. Bring it on. (laughs) There you go. I love it. I love it. Okay, for our bakers who are listening or people who are considering doing something in that field, Mm -hmm. where can people go to learn more about you and then also Cake Decorating Magazine or any other resource you think would be valuable for our listeners? Oh, sure. So I have a website. It's my own personal website. It's nothing too crazy. But it is annemariemadala.com. So I'm sure in the show notes you'll have my proper spelling of my name. But it's annemariemadala.com. And you can find me there and it's links to basically all the pages that I write for and all the publications. And then American Cake Decorating Magazine is AmericanCakeDecorating.com. Very easy. You can subscribe. It is a digital subscription and we're working on getting back to print, which we're really excited about. Please join us on Instagram. American Cake Decorating has tremendous amount of followers and an incredible community of people. So for those bakers out there, it is a tremendous resource to be connected to us. And if you're a professional or looking to be a professional, Pastry Arts Magazine is an excellent resource as well. It's pastryartsmag.com. You can sign up and subscribe again, digital magazine. And again, a huge community out there of people. And they're such an amazing supportive community, both for aspiring and professional bakers on both magazines. So definitely check them out. Perfect. Lots of resources for our sweet makers out there for sure. (laughs) A thousand percent. Absolutely. Lots of resources. Wonderful. Anne-Marie, thank you so much. I am so glad we're connected and I really, really appreciate you coming on the show and sharing your story today. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. I had a great time. Anne-Marie has a great story in and of itself. But I have to say, my favorite line of this entire show is her advice to recognize who you've been all along. Why is being true to yourself so difficult when it holds the key to your happiness? Something to ponder. And then consider what you need to do or what you need to put in place to come closer to the person you really are. Sticking with the theme of finding fulfillment in our businesses, next week we're talking about designing a predictably profitable business without the hustle and burnout that doing quote-unquote all the things inevitably brings forth. Thanks for spending time with me today. If you'd like to show support for the podcast, let me know how it's helped you, something new you've learned, or suggest a topic that you'd like to hear more about. 
Just add it as a review. I read everyone personally and absolutely use suggestions as guidance for new guests and topics. There are other ways to show support for the podcast, too. Visit our shop for a wide variety of gift biz paraphernalia, like mugs, t-shirts, water bottles, journals, and more, featuring logos and quotes to inspire you throughout your day. Take a look at all of these options over at giftbizunwrapped.com forward slash shop. All proceeds of anything that you purchase there go to help offset the costs of producing this show. And now, be safe and well, and I'll see you again next week on the Gift Biz Unwrapped podcast. I want to make sure you're familiar with my free Facebook group called Gift Biz Breeze. It's a place where we all gather and are a community to support each other. I've got a really fun post in there that's my favorite of the week, I have to say, where I invite all of you to share what you're doing, to show pictures of your product, to show what you're working on for the week, to get reaction from other people, and just for fun because we all get to see the wonderful products that everybody in the community is making my favorite post every single week, without doubt. Wait, what? Aren't you part of the group already? If not, make sure to jump over to Facebook and search for the group Gift Biz Breeze. Don't delay. Come join us in Gift Biz Breeze today.